You may have never heard of, of Jimmy Donaldson before, um, but if you were a little younger, um, you would know him um, as the YouTube creator, Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast is the highest earning creator of all time on YouTube. He's only 24 years old and he has amassed a following of 131 million subscribers and a fortune also over $100 million. He makes ridiculous videos full of, of crazy games and stunts and a whole lot of giving away money to people for no reason at all. Um, and he seems to be the most entertaining person to watch give money to someone else. And thus people watch him all over. Actually, Mr. Beast, I, I would say, is, um, is more interesting, the most exciting ways of giving away money. And he's committed himself to give away all of his money before the day that he dies. In his latest video, he used that money to cure a thousand people of blindness. That's right, the video, the video starts with him talking to a doctor who explains that half of the blindness in the world could be cured with a 10 minute surgery. So he then paid that doctor and his medical team to perform that surgery a thousand times on a thousand people. And of course, he filmed their excitement upon receiving their sight. He even gave them additional gifts like a college scholarship or a, a new Tesla, a briefcase full of money. And, and I know what you're thinking. I should probably watch more YouTube. That's what I'm hearing. But as I'm sure you know, the internet, the internet world is rough. It's a tough place to be a public figure on the internet. And almost as soon as the video came out, people hated it. People started hating on Mr. Beast. Why does he have to film it when he helps people? Why couldn't he just help them? What about all the people that he didn't help? And the world online divided in their response, as I suppose they always do. And we're going to see something actually pretty similar in our passage today. And today we're going to look at a story from John chapter 9 where Jesus heals a blind man. Now, just to be clear, Jesus didn't heal someone with curable blindness, which is basically just really, really bad cataracts. Jesus healed a man who had been blind from birth with a blindness that had no hope of a cure at all. And just like, though, this recent video, as soon as Jesus healed him, the people took sides. Right? Obviously, something amazing had happened, but their hatred of Jesus was was deep. And they found ways to show that even in their response, even, even to a thing like this. But while some hated and some were confused, this man, this man who was once blind and now he could clearly see, he clearly saw who Jesus was. And he believed in him and he worshiped him and he started telling others about him. And so let me read this passage from John chapter 9. There's a lot here in, in John 9 for us to consider. Um, it's a rather long story, but it's so good. So we're just going to read the whole thing. We're going to read all of chapter 9. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. John chapter 9. If you picked up one of these Bibles on your way in, it's on page 992 in those Bibles. And um, we would encourage you, if you don't have a Bible of your own at home, please take one of these with you. They're our gift to you. We would love for you to have one. So here's John 9. It says, as he, that's Jesus, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. And then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. And so he went and washed and he came back seeing. The neighbors... And those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, 
Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others says, no, but he is like him. But he kept saying, I am the man. And so they, they asked him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Salome and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened the eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees says, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who's a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. And so they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he's opened your eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews has already agreed that anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ. He was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, you're his disciple, but we are the disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man... We don't know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. All right, so this it's, it's an incredible story. Jesus does this amazing miracle. And I think we probably don't even actually realize how amazing this, this miracle is, but it's verse 33 that shows us how incredible this miracle actually is. So we would do well to read this verse again, and we should read it literally. L let's read verse 33. It says this, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. Never has this happened? And let me tell you, if you read the Bible cover to cover, you will find examples all over the Old Testament. You'll find these examples of, of the Old Testament people or the apostles in the New Testament, the book of Acts. You'll find these examples of them healing the sick, right? That they'll multiply food. They'll raise the dead. They will do all sorts of miraculous things. But the only person in all of Scripture to ever heal the blind is Jesus. 
And according to the biblical scholar Kenneth Gangel, there are more instances of Jesus healing the blind than any other type of miracle. And the healing of the blind is a profound statement about Jesus. Because unlike, unlike all of his other miracles, nobody else could do it. And it the healing of the blind was specifically one of the things that the Old Testament prophets tell us that the Messiah will do. And so Jesus does the unimaginable. Jesus does what nobody else can do. Jesus does what only the Messiah will do. He does the unimaginable that we might believe in him and worship him and tell others about him. And in, in John chapter 8, so the one right before this, Jesus says to the people that he is the light of the world. And this causes this huge argument to take place with the Jewish leaders. And it culminates finally at the end of John 8 with them picking up stones. They're about to kill Jesus and Jesus slips away from them. And then we're told right after slipping away that he passes by, right? he leaves the fight and then he passes by and he sees this man a man born blind, and Jesus is going to prove that he is the light of the world by bringing light into the darkness of the blindness that this man had experienced his whole life. That's why, again, in chapter 9, in verse 5, he's going to say it again, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Okay, so, so look back at our passage. Look at verse 1. It says this, he passed by, Jesus passed by, and he saw a man blind from birth. Don't miss that. Jesus saw him. He saw him. As you go through scripture, here's what you'll find. There are all sorts of names for God. They're all over the place. But one of the most powerful is the name El Roy. El Roy, the God who sees me. And it's a name that was given to God by, by Hagar when she was fleeing from her oppressive master, Sarah. And God meets her and he makes a promise to her in the midst of her suffering. And then this is what she says in Genesis 16, 13. It says, so she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, truly, here I have been seen by him who looks after me. This, this man was blind, but when Elroy walked by, he saw him. And no matter the pain or the suffering or the anguish or the grief that you're experiencing today, know this, our God is Elroy and he is looking after you and he sees you. God sees you rightly and fully, even, even if his followers don't. And how often, right, how often is it that that we just walk by or we drive by that, that beggar on the street. And whether we, whether we help them or not, we don't see them. Or perhaps even worse, what happens here with the disciples. The disciples don't see him, they question him. Look at verse 2. It says, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or, or his parents? that he was born blind. The disciples aren't concerned with this man or his situation. They don't see him with compassion. They see him with curiosity. They see an opportunity for a theological argument, but Jesus sees an opportunity to demonstrate grace. They, they're concerned with pointing the finger at somebody trapped in blindness. And Jesus is concerned with setting him free through faith. Friends, how often do we see the, the struggling and the suffering and, and the hurting? And instead of following Jesus' example and demonstrating care and compassion, we just point the finger and we accuse or we question. Instead of helping those in need, we turn perhaps to our friends and we just ponder some deep theological truth that makes us feel better. Right? We gather together in the comfort of a Bible study so that we don't have to see those who are in need and reach out to them in love. Okay, but just back up for a moment. Consider the theological problem here. 
The disciples are working with an assumption that any suffering in a person's life must be the direct repercussions of somebody's sin. Right? Now, so to be clear, the reason there is suffering in the world is because there's sin in the world. That part is, that part is true. But it is dangerous and dishonoring to blame the sick and the suffering for their sickness and their suffering. And so while the disciples see an opportunity for a debate, Jesus quickly puts it into it. And he changes the tenor of the whole conversation. So look at verse 3. Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus says, you're, you're getting caught up in what the cause of this purpose, of this person's suffering is. So let me point you to something far more important. Instead of talking about the cause, let's talk about the purpose. The, the purpose of his suffering, the purpose of his blindness is that the works of God might be displayed in him. The purpose was the glory of God and the demonstration of his power that people might come to see him and know him more rightly and fully. The, the commentator Philip Comfort brings this truth then to us in this way. He says, rather than argue, debate, and question who has sinned, we ought to look at each situation as an opportunity for God to manifest his grace. Friend, if you are struggling or suffering or in pain today, instead of, instead of allowing Satan to control the narrative and to tell you that it's your fault or that it's somebody else's fault, hear me, it doesn't matter the cause. Focus your eyes on the purpose. God, God wants to use even your suffering so that his works might be seen in the world. God wants to use even your suffering that his glory might, might be known. The God of the universe knows you. He, he sees you. He, he loves you. And he works in all of our suffering and affliction and disappointment and pain and loss and grief, if you'll let him. He works in all of it. And what, and what is the great glory of God, the great glory of God is actually his love and his compassion on his people. And so the, the, the great British commentator, William Barclay, points, points out this tremendous truth. He says this, he says, for John, and you'll see it if you read the book of John like we're doing right now, for John, the miracles are always a sign of the glory and the power of God. But the writers of the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, had a different point of view. They regarded them as a demonstration of the compassion of Jesus. Right now, hear this. At its heart is the supreme truth that the glory of God lies in his compassion. That he never so fully reveals his glory as when he reveals his mercy. Does that mean that we're all going to get a guaranteed healing like this blind man here in John 9? No, but let me tell you why. Because God's greatest glory and his greatest mercy is not seen in your healing, but in your salvation. God's greatest glory is seen in you looking and living and loving like Jesus. And so here's the promise of scripture. God will use all the suffering in your life to work out the good of your salvation. Whether that comes through your healing or that comes through your perseverance. And we, we know that from our passage here, God can use healing to bring about salvation, right? At the end of the passage, the guy's worshiping God. So he can use healing to do that. But then listen to Romans 8. This is verse 28. It says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Okay, so God is working all things together for, for my good. That, that's good, right? That's a good thing to hear. He's working that in me. I hope the good he's working is healing. But actually, it's so much better because the good that he's working is my salvation. Listen to verse 29 and 30. He says, 
for, so I'm working all of this for good. Here's the demonstration of that for those he foreknew. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What's the good that he's working? It's your salvation. It's your justification that you would be forgiven in full. What's the good? He's working that you would be conformed into the image of Christ, that you would look and live and love like Jesus did. That's the good that God is working. What's the good? It's the final glorification when we will stand on that day with God forever. Now, not just healed, but made entirely new. That's the good that God is working. The promise of God isn't earthly healing, though he loves to heal. The promise of God is so much better. It's our salvation. Let me just just show you this in one other place in Scripture. 2 Corinthians 12. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul is telling the church in Corinth that he's being harassed, he says, by a messenger of Satan. And he calls it his thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was but it caused him great anguish. And look at verse eight. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. So did it leave him? Did God heal him? Did God set him free? No. Look at verse nine. Here's what God said. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. So then Paul says, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The works of God are on display in Paul's life, not by him being healed, but by the power of Christ resting upon him in the midst of his suffering. In the midst of his suffering. So you, listen, are you suffering? I think this, I think we're all suffering. I think at the end of the day, we can look around the room and to a number, all of us are suffering today. And so my prayer, my prayer is that you would be set free from from anguish, set free from, from your pain, set free from your distress. But more than that, more than that, I pray that the works of God may be displayed in you. And you know what it looked like in this man's life? It looked like Jesus doing the unimaginable and healing him from a lifetime of blindness. Jesus does the unimaginable that we might believe in him and worship him and then tell others about him. And so look what happens here. Jesus spits on the ground and he makes mud and he puts the mud on the guy's eyes. And then he says, go, go wash yourself off in a pool. This guy doesn't even know who Jesus is. At this point, but he, but he knew apparently enough, or at least he was desperate enough that he obeyed him. And here's what happened. As soon as he washed his eyes, we're told that he came back seeing Jesus did the unimaginable. And he sent this man on a journey of faith that goes through the rest of this chapter. And so here at the beginning, he refers to Jesus just as a man, but he still obeys him. But as we move through the passage, we're going to see his understanding of and his response to Jesus maturing. In in verse 11, he says he's the man called Jesus. But then he points to his obedience. But if we move ahead to verse 17, he's talking to the religious leaders. They say, okay, what do you say about him? He healed you. Who do you say that he is? He says, "He's, he's a prophet. He's a prophet. He's moved from man to prophet. And when they keep sort of pumping him for information, he says in verse 27, I told you already, you wouldn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? So he's moved from obeying 
to now he's identifying himself as a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. And if we keep moving forward in the passage, even more Jesus comes to him, right? A little later and says to him, do you believe in the son of man? Right, look at verses 35 to 38. Jesus heard that they had cast him out at out of the temple and having found him, He said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, and and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have seen him. It is he who is speaking to you. It's me, Jesus. It's me. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. The culmination of this man's healing isn't that he received his sight. Because the works of God were not complete. The work of God is that he now believes Jesus is who Jesus says he is. And he's he's worshiping him. Jesus does the unimaginable in our lives. That we would believe in him. And that we would worship him. And that we would tell others about him. You see that we, we believe, we worship, and then we tell. We tell others. And so when this man gets back from from the pool, he's received his healing and he just starts telling people about it. So look again, starting at verse 8. It says, The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, "It, It is he. Others says, No, but it is like him. But he kept saying, I am the man. And so they said to him, Well, then how were your eyes opened? And he points to Jesus and he says, the man called Jesus, he made mud and he he anointed my eyes and he said to me, go to Siloam and wash. And I went and I washed and I received my sight. The the man isn't just telling people, but they also can, they can just tell, they can obviously see a difference in his life. But he doesn't let those questions just slip by. It's me. Look what Jesus did. Look what he did for me. People don't know how to process it. People don't know how to deal with it. That's okay. He's still telling them all about it. Right? And that's, listen, that's the truth today as well. I love the way, again, William Barclay here says this. He says, Jesus is still doing things which seem to the unbeliever far too good and far too wonderful to be true. But that doesn't make it any less true and it shouldn't make us any less likely to share it. Look at his testimony. It's it's profound in its simplicity. And he's not trying to explain everything that he doesn't even understand. He's just giving a testimony of the work of God in his life. We see it perhaps most clearly in verse 25. He answers the Pharisees. Let me tell you what I don't know, whether he's a sinner or not. Not sure on that one? No idea. Here's what I do know. I used to be blind, and now I'm seeing. And that seems kind of remarkable. So while I can't answer that question, this seems like the thing we should be focusing on here. I used to be blind, and now I see. But no matter who asked him, from, from his neighbors who, who doubted, to his parents who were afraid, to the Pharisees who were insulting him and persecuting him and threatening him, to each of them, he says, listen, Jesus did something amazing in my life. Let me, let me tell you about it. It's a simple fact, one commentator says, of the Christian experience that many a man may not be able to put into theologically correct language what he believes Jesus to be, but in spite of that, he can witness to what Jesus has done for his soul. Jesus does the unimaginable that we might believe in him and worship him and tell others about him. And here's the thing, the most unimaginable thing of all, indeed the thing that Jesus is concerned with doing the most of all is working our salvation. The most unimaginable thing of all is that Jesus came to earth to save sinners like you and me. I mean, that's the the testimony of Scripture, right? We weren't just blind. We were dead in our sin and in his mercy. Jesus came to earth. He became 
man. He experienced all the the suffering and anguish of this broken world. He bore it all and he bore it all the way to death. And, And the place where the glory of God and the compassion of God meet is the cross of Christ. And and it's on that cross that the greatest miracle of ever became, became possible. And Jesus died for us, the miracle of our salvation. He laid down his life. And then three days later, he rose again with power, with victory, victory over sin and death. And he offers now forgiveness, relationship with God to anybody who would repent and believe in him. And that may sound Too good to be true, but that's what Jesus does. He does the unimaginable, that we would believe in him and worship him and tell others about him. Jesus has died for sinners like me, like you. And I pray that that today you might believe in him and worship him and then go tell other people about him. Let's pray. Father, we, we profess you as, as Elroy, the God who sees. Lord, you see us, each of us, all of us. Lord, you know us precisely, and you love us. You love us so much that, that Jesus would come to save us. And what's amazing about the testimony of Scripture is that Jesus, on his road to dying for our salvation, just just did good everywhere he went. He was blessing people everywhere he went so that as many as possible might turn and follow him. And Lord, the same is true today. You are blessing us even in the midst of our suffering. And so we pray, Lord, we pray, Lord, that in light of those blessings, that we would believe in you and worship you and that we would tell others about you. In Jesus' name, amen.